My early life was at Lake Baringo. My, my, I was born in Nairobi, but my parents were living up at Lake Baringo. And in those days, it was like a 70 mile journey from Nakuru, which yes. was the nearest town, right out into, 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 into up to the lake. And my father started up there by hunting crocodiles, making a living out of that. And uh, eventually um, set up the fisheries business there. And he started a small lodge called the Lake, uh, called the Fish Eagle Camp on the lake shore. So what we've done in our lives is a continuation of his tourism business. We've been in the game all our lives. He died when he was 42, yeah. so he was quite young to, 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 to pass on at that age. And, and I was 13 at the time. My, my mother had six children. My youngest brother was six months old. And uh, our nearest kind of resupply area was Nakuru, 70 miles away, on a terrible road, by the way, actually. In those days, it was a very difficult road. Um, so there was, we all went to boarding school, all the kids. Yeah. Um, all the ones that were old enough anyway. And mum came into our room when we were about to go back to school about the day before mm. and said that we needed to take a good hard look at the house because it's probably the last time we'd see it because her family was pressing her to move the, all of us back to England. Well, <laughs> I just said to mum, look, there's no way, I'm not going back to England. I've never been there and yes. I don't want to go there. And if you have to go, that's fine, but I'm not coming. <laughs> I was quite, quite stubborn. And she, she said, fine, well, anyway, I'm just telling you, that's what the plan is. So I decided not to go back to school. I was at the Prince of Wales at the yes. time, Nairobi school. And um, I managed to get a lift on one of uh, Jonathan Leakey's snake cars to go to the Kakamega Forest with a, with a plan to meet my mother in Nakuru the next day on its way back to Baringo. And I didn't come back on that car. I stayed up in the Kakamega there. And, and uh, my, my father had this small hobby where he collected quite rare species of birds and small mammals to supply breeding institutes around the world to try and keep these animals alive in captivity in case they ever had to be re, re, you know, put back in the wild again. And that was something that we really enjoyed as kids because we went on all the safaris with him on these collecting trips. And um, I said to mum, you know, okay, we can't manage the lodge and we can't manage the fisheries, but that business we can manage. We just, you've got all the contacts, you run the office, we'll go out and do the catching. So when I was up there, I decided to go into the Kaimosi forest and try and catch a pair of the giant great blue turac turacos. They're, they're, they're very, very rare and very valuable, actually. Yeah. So I spent two weeks, so I thought, well, while I'm here, I'll, and then when I go home, I'll have a prize and I'll be able to persuade my mother to say, okay, let's give it a go. Anyway, it didn't work like that, by the way, but I did manage to collect a couple of those birds up in the forest and get them back to Baringo again, hitchhiking all the way and arrived back home and my mother had now gone off to the coast yes. to get used to the idea of having lost one of her children because yes. I was a missing person for that time and, and uh, being looked for by everybody. I just turned up at home, yeah. Well, there was no one there that day. So, but, but the, our neighbors, the Leakeys were there, so yes. we, I met up with them and 
It's quite a long story. Yeah, but it's a fascinating one. As I grew up there in Baringo, and I got to about 16 or 17, um, and the business we proposed worked out fine, and yes. all my brothers and sister went to school, and they finished their education fine. So it worked out very well, actually, and we stayed here. The local tri tribal Injems people, they said to me, it's very bad for you to be staying in your mother's house as you become adult, yes. as a man, you yeah. know, you, you need your own place. Please find yourself a place and yes. we'll give it to you so you can set up your boma outside of your mother's house. Wow. Which was amazing. Oh my God. They're just walking into them. Oh, sorry. In the distance, man. Oh, and the baby, oh. it's even a baby zebra. Let me get him instead. He's coming. Yeah. We had a great friend who used to come down from Molo um, to spend uh, his short holidays from the farm in August because that's the wettest month of the year in Molo. And yeah. they wanted to come and get there, dry out because it was so wet there. And he was a builder. Yes. Um, and, you know, he really understood how to uh, put up buildings in a real traditional African way. This friend of ours from Molo came down and he said, you should really set up a little homestay place here. And then as visitors come, you can receive some income and, and it'll make it possible for you to pay your bills and get yes. to the mainland and run your boat and all those things. So I said, OK, well, if I don't know how to build, but if you'd like to be my partner. Yes. You can teach me how to build, and we'll run the we'll 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 start start a business here. And so we we didn't he didn't have any money either. <laughs> so we went to Jonathan Leakey, who was our yes. neighbour on the mainland, yes. and he was delighted to join up. So we were three people all together. And when I was 19, we built Island Camp. Wow! And that's where I learned how to build. I've been building all over Kenya. So that since was your then. first that first, was the first time project. Yeah, yep, at yeah. 19. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> And it was very successful. It was the time when all straight the straight from the get go, it was successful. <coughs> straight from the f the beginning, yeah. It was. Yeah. We were actually um, competing with Governor's Camp, yes, because ours was a fully tented camp with thatch roofs over them, yes. And uh, Governors were building Governor's Camp at the time, and and so we were seeing who could open up first. That was the first tented camp in Kenya, actually. Was it really? Yeah. Wow, <laughs> it's been there all these years. Yeah. It's uh, anyway. It's still there, and uh, it's uh, different owners now but it's still going and it's going well, quite well. Mm. I, I hear good things about it nowadays. So Island Camp, how, how long did you run that for then? Uh, we must have had it from 72 until about 85, I suppose. Yes. Uh, 85, when it was sold out to Lonro eventually. You sold it? Yes. Yes, yeah. they came in and... They came in and they took it over and then they resold it to one of their, their, um, the, 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 um, their tourism manager. Yes. Perry Hennessy bought it and, and he still runs it today. To, to, to this day. Yeah. So you've sold out now. So we've sold out there. And we had, we, we, we in the meantime, managed to get another small island yeah. where we built our home for the kids and everything, uh, for, for our family. And yes. we still have that. And on okay, the lake. in, in yeah. Beringa. Yeah. So, okay, so you've sold out now. What's your next move? So the next move was some crazy guy said to me I ought to go to the Mara because mm. the government was persuading people to go and open up wheat farming there. Mm. And I wasn't a farmer either. So. Anyway, I thought, well, I'll give it a go. Yes. So I went down to the Mara to 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 grow wheat in the area. Uh, I don't know if you know the Mara well, but in the north part of the Mara uh, uh, area, where all the wildlife is now, and where the the the, the uh, Lonra hotels built yes, a hotel. Yes, we stayed there a couple. The Mara Safari. Club. Yeah, Mara Safari Club, and um, we put in three thousand acres of wheat there. Mm. But we had all this game coming in and, and we, had to have, we had 27 kilometers of electric fencing to keep the animals out. Wow. But in the dry seasons and the dry times, the elephants soon learned how to get through those mm. fences. And so there was a real problem with elephants. And I, I remember going up to see the paramount chief there and saying to him, you know, it's quite ridiculous that you should be allowing wheat farming in here when you've got all this wildlife. Mm. Surely, you know, you, 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 you should be encouraging tourism and then getting some revenue from that. Yes. Um, and he just said, no, it's not possible because, uh, you know, the history of wildlife in Kenya is that it belongs to government. Mm. 
and uh, whatever you do with wildlife you have to get permission from government and all revenue that accrues from it accrues back to mm. government so it's not private sector business yes. you can't do it <laughs> so i thought well uh, i can't really believe this mm. but we've got to try and do something mm. so i went to see our minister of environmental affairs who is philip leakey yes oh, same leakey family same leakey own. family mm. yeah we, we we kind of grew up with that family mm. so we know them all quite well and 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 he said you're right it's 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 wrong um, but I'll introduce you to a lawyer. Mm. So we met, we met a, a lawyer in Nairobi and tried to persuade the Paramount chief to talk to him up there. And he, he wasn't interested. Mm. He just said, no, it's not, forget it. So I managed to persuade Philip Leakey to come himself with a lawyer to talk to the Paramount chief. Yes. And Olin Dutu, famous guy. He was yes, well yes, known. Yes, yes, very famous. Yeah. Stephen, is it? Uh, Stephen's, it was Stephen's father. Yeah. Yeah. So Stephen worked for me in the mm. conservancy there for a long time when we got it going eventually. But so we, we, we um, put together a group of landowners and formed an association of landowners. And then we had to challenge the government policy in the high court in order to allow the establishment to, to be registered and, and to take off. And was this the first conservancy in Kenya? It was, it was the first, yes, it was the first pr uh, conservancy on public land. Mm. Um, there were other uh, private sector initiatives on private farms doing mm. small, small things. I mean, Lewa had already got started with the rhino sanctuary at that yeah. stage. But um, on tribal trust land, it, it was the first and, and it was quite a big deal at the time. Yeah. And then now the whole of the surrounding area of the Mara is covered in conservancies and all over Kenya. It's amazing. So, so then what happened to that project? It's still going yeah. very successfully and everyone's getting good revenue out of it mm. and their tourism. In fact, um, Lonro came, um, decided to support us when mm. we were trying to get this going. Um, and and uh, um, the, 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 the person who managed on Lonro at the time was Mark Newman. And he said, look, this is such a good idea. I really want mm. to support this conservation initiative. And, and, and with that, he built the Mara Safari Club to give us sustainable revenue in wow. the area for the, for the people who own the land. So it, it, it really got a lot of support and, mm. and um, it was a great thing. The, the Maasai loved it, obviously, because yes. they could live their lives in their own traditional cultural that, that's way. What, that, that was the point you're making, right? Yeah. And at the same uh, time... Because when they, when they brought the wheat farmers in, they had to move off. Mm. So they could stay with their cattle and stay with their cultural way of life and, and, and enjoy a dish, you know, uh, uh, extra income from the, from the conservation work. So take me from there to here. <laughs> <laughs> then after that, by the way, we started the Mara Conservancy, the, tri yes. the Triangle. So there's been a lot of history in the Mara. We, yep. We've been down there for 20 years or more. Mm. And, um, and then while we were doing that, we had to try and earn some money. Yeah. Because we'd stopped the farming. We'd returned 21,000 acres of wheat land back into conservation. It wasn't making money? or Not for me, it wasn't. No. It was earning revenue for the people who own the land. Yes. So I started a small project on an island in Lake Victoria to take all this huge nucleus of tourism from the Mara down to the lake to see yes. the source of the River Nile and to catch yes. Nile perch and stuff. So we ran a lodge down there. We built a lodge on the lake shore. From Lake Victoria, we, we, we were at a loose end. We were just wondering what to do next. And then we came here. And that's a really interesting story how we came here. We didn't plan to come here. It wasn't an, uh, an idea of, you know, we didn't want to come and settle in the, in the Lewa. There was no opportunity anyway. Yeah. And uh, one day Ian Craig, who owned the Lewa Conservancy, said that there was a block of land right in the middle of the Lewa Conservancy called the Manyangalo Farm. And this is, and this is where we are now. Yeah. And it was about seven and a half thousand acres. And they'd been trying to purchase this land for several years um, because it's a perfect add-on to the Conservancy. And it's got this great wetland where all the elephants come in every day and all the buffalo come in every day. And, and uh, it just made sense to, for it to be part of the Conservancy. Anyway, he hadn't been able to get it. And it was taken, it had been bought by the Kenya Tea Development Authority and they were going to irrigate eucalyptus plantations here to grow wood f to fuel the tea factories up in Meru. And uh, it was like 10 to midnight, the deal was done, they were moving in and he said, is there anything you can do? And I, so I went and had a chat to the chairman of the KTDA yes. and, and, and just said that, you know, look, 
it's dry land, irrigation's expensive. Mm. There won't be any water for the animals downstream and there won't be any water for the people who live below the conservancy. So, it, and, and irrigation's expensive. It's mm. not a win-win for anyone, it's, it doesn't work. So after getting good advice from friends and having lots of chats with him, we decided the best way to deal with this would be to, for us to find some land in the Timau area where there yeah. was high rainfall and much more suitable for their purpose and uh, try and set it up so that we could do a land exchange and then we could put this piece of land down here into the into the conservancy anyhow so we found some land in Tamal and and it took two years to get the valuations all done and then so that the values added up and matched completely uh, accurately and then they there was a requirement for some surv survey to be done to prove that it was dry land and not really suitable for eucalyptus and once we'd got all that done, um, the government said, deal's on. And Lewa couldn't produce the money that was required for the, for the land swap. Yes. And I'd done all this work. Yeah. Not for myself at all, for the conservancy. Yes. So um, Ian said to me, he said, well, why don't you buy it? That was in 2000. Yeah. Yeah. And I, of course, we didn't have the money to, buy, to, to do it. So we gathered a few friends together and we bought it together. And, and, um, and we, we bought the land for the KTDA. Yes. And they're extremely happy. And then we moved in here and removed all the fencing. And now it's part of Lewa. The, ne the next step for us now is to secure the land like they have with a perpetual yes. conservation easement so that we can just have it protected. Exactly and part what they have. Of, that's what they have, yeah. Mm. So then we, we, we had to make a living yes. and um, we asked the Conservancy if we, could, if we could have access to the greater Conservancy area mm. and put up a small lodge facility to, to get some visitors in here to enjoy the place with us. That's so a fantastic facility. So I built the lodge, Sirikoi. Yeah. It's a beautiful, so how old is it now? <laughs> uh, we started in 2002 and it, it's taken about 10 years because you know we've just build, been building it up slowly slowly it yes. hasn't we didn't come in with a lot of money and just do it in one shot yeah. so you've done it incrementally yeah we live here and we we just built as we go it's such yeah. a beautiful place well thank you very much and what, yeah. what what is your what is your favorite memory or favorite part of this place what you know well, uh, to be quite honest, I mean, I, I think the nicest thing for us is mm. to, uh, it, 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 to have the privilege of waking up in a beautiful environment, very peaceful place with elephants on your lawn. Yeah. You know, that's got to be the it's best thing. Up. And I mean, we live with this every single day and it's just so lucky beautiful. and so beautiful. And we're very lucky that we get a lot of guests coming down here to enjoy it with us. Yeah. Well, we're, we're very grateful <laughs> that we've been down here. And thank you so much for telling us this story. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you very much for thank coming. You.